Order. We must move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment. I call Mr. David McNary. Mr. McNary. Question one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I believe that planning can make a very positive contribution to the development of our local economy, and that is why my department gives priority to proposals that have the potential to bring investment to the local economy and create jobs, and ensures that these applications are processed to a decision as quickly as possible. Performance across all categories of applications has improved in recent years, and I know strenuous efforts are being made to continue this improvement. However, I also acknowledge that more can be done, and that is why I announced in January a series of new actions to further improve our performance and planning. These actions include shortening and simplifying planning policy, continuing to implement key reforms such as initiating new development plan work, encouraging more pre-application discussions and pre-application community consultations, improved consultee performance, including NIEA within my own department, and improved customer service. In May 2011, there were 60 live Article 31 applications. Since then, 46 applications have been determined, five of which are awaiting the outcome of the appeal process, and one further application is scheduled for a public inquiry. Since May 2011, a further 11 new applications have been designated Article 31, and five of these have been determined within the new PFG target for six months. This includes the application for the redevelopment of Windsor Park, where the applicant engaged with the department and relevant stakeholders in a comprehensive pre-application process, including piloting pre-application community consultation, and resulted in the submission of a quality application, a speedy process, and a determination within 11 weeks. I want to create a better environment and a stronger economy, and my aim is to create a planning system that works to achieve this. Well, Mr. Minari for supplementary. I do thank the Minister for his, uh, uh, his response there. He, he has his own uh, refreshing style of not answering the question about uh, job losses, so I'll have another go, if I may, Deputy Speaker. Perhaps, sir, would the Minister detail any sensitive planning applications which he is currently discussing to transfer to OFM, DFM, or is likely and intending to discuss such a matter with them soon? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr. McInerney for the supplementary. Any <laughs> failure to answer the supplementary won't be a deliberate attempt to avoid answering it. It will just be down to a complete lack of understanding as to what he means. <laughs> I, am, I am the Minister for, for the Environment. Uh, my department is responsible for making planning decisions. I am currently involved in no negotiations with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. I'm fairly certain that my department is not involved in any conversations with the Department of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister around the transfer of any particular application, sensitive or otherwise. However, if there is a particular application that Mr McInerney would like to discuss with me or with OFM, DFM, I'd be happy to meet with him at a later stage. Call Mr. Cattleboy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister. But could the Minister give an assurance to the House that following consultation on the strategic plan policy statement, the draft one, that job creation and economic growth will be key elements in the planning future of that bill, and also will he bring forward uh, some policy that will lead to sustainable rural communities? Uh, thank the member for the questions. There, uh, following consultation on the single strategic plan and policy statement, yes, economic considerations will have a deter no, not a determinative, a material weight in determining planning decisions. However, there is nothing new in that. Currently, weight is, considerable weight is attached to economic considerations when applications are being processed. However, that weight is not determining 
Good planning is a balancing act between balancing between what is good for the economy and what is good for the environment. And I don't believe that one should be compromised at the expense of the other. As regards sustainable rural communities, yes, that is a very important issue. It's one that Mr Boylan and other members have raised with me before. We spoke at length during a debate uh, earlier this month on rural housing. However, I do know the issue of rural businesses is one that is also very important, not just to members in this House, but obviously to the communities that they represent. Call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I would ask the Minister if he has any plans to progress the planning bill that he withdrew last year. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank the member for his question. I have answered similar questions in the, this chamber before, and I will give the, the same answer that I gave those questions. The answer is quite simply no. I uh, made the decision not to move the planning bill. I, I made that announcement in the House here on the 22nd of October last year and cited sound reasons for doing so reasons that were procedural and evidential and legal. I must say that anywhere I have gone, any sector with which I have engaged in the aftermath of making that announcement and that decision, they have received that decision well. There seems to be a consensus outside this House, although maybe not inside it, that the planning bill as amended was not the way to go about improving our planning system. Call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Gurma agat alaski on koilegs mui his selection ayrad asin the fragni he kamshi haka ganigi shaw. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answers up until this point. Um, I did note with interest that in terms of sharpening up the performance of planning, he made specific reference to NIEA. Um, uh, it's with regret that I have to say that. That is one agency that keeps recurring in terms of performance, in terms of efficiency, in terms of actually, for no apparent reason, delaying the planning process. So, could I ask the Minister what measures he will take specifically in regard to making that organisation much more efficient in, in its decision making and much more efficient in its liaison with planning service? I thank the, the member for that question. In the preamble, I suppose, <laughs> or foreword to his uh, question, the member said that NIEA is one agency. It is one agency, however. I'm sure many members, when dealing with the NIEA, would think that it's a lot more than, than one agency. And weaknesses have been identified within the agency that fall back to the, the fact that it is constructed of so many different individual sectors and there has been speculation and indeed commentary to suggest that, that, that those sections work in a siloed approach. This is something that has been brought up again more recently in the Mills report in relation to waste. It is something that causes great frustration to applicants, agents and developers and indeed objectors when it comes to pr the processing of planning applications and it's something that I certainly intend to tackle. I have asked my permanent secretary and indeed the chief executive of NIEA to conduct a root and branch review of the agency with a view to improving its structure and its performance and I look forward to bringing those proposals back to this assembly. Or maybe, or could I encourage members please to be brief when asking questions and could I also encourage other members who are not asking questions uh, to remain silent please so that I can at least hear the Minister. I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Question number two. I am committed to ensuring that positions of responsibility on a council and positions on external statutory bodies on which the Council is represented are shared across all the political parties and independents represented on Council. 
Schedule 3 to the Local Government Bill makes provision for a council to select from either the Dehaunt, St. Lag formula methods or the single transferable vote approach to achieve this objective. The inclusion of options in the Bill provides flexibility for the political parties represented on the Council to agree a method for the sharing of positions of responsibility that they consider most appropriate for their particular circumstances. If the political parties cannot agree the method to be adopted by a qualified majority, the Dehaunt method is specified as the default position. In order to mitigate the potential favouring of political parties with larger levels of representation on the Council, the selected method for allocating positions will be applied at the start of a Council term, following a local government election, across all positions over the four-year term of the Council. Each position would only be held for a single year unless a longer term of office on an external body is specified by that body. This will provide the opportunity, in line with the democratic process, for parties with lower levels of representation or independence to hold positions of responsibility. Well, Mr. Dixon, for supplement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the answer. Do you not accept, though, Minister, that if the intention of the legislation is to ensure uh, fairness in the distribution of areas of responsibility within local government, that the hunt does not deliver that and can never deliver that, and that that can only be delivered by the use of STV as the preferred means of um, sharing responsibility within local government? And while you have given a menu of, of options available, uh, surely the default situation should always be STV. Thank uh, Mr. Dixon for his question and supplementary, and indeed understand some of the concerns that he has raised. However, it is my belief, and I believe it, it is a belief shared by others, that by running whatever method of selection that is chosen by a council at the start of a council term and running it for every position over the four year term at that stage smaller parties and independents will get chances that they would not necessarily achieve or get even under STV should it be run on an annual basis as is currently the setup in most if not every councils. I think uh, the reform of local government provides a tremendous opportunity to us all. I, I believe it is vitally important that those that people vote for, those parties, those independents that people vote for, have the opportunities afforded to them that are available to members of larger parties. And I believe by running whatever formula a council decides on at the start of the term, these opportunities will be much more available than is currently the situation. Mr. Jim Allister. The Minister's Bill anticipates that there may be control within a council by a cabinet system. Uh, would that uh, cabinet meet in secret? And has the Minister any concerns that by reposing all power in such a small power bureau that the role of every other councillor would be vastly diminished and they would become mere spectators? Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Allister for his question. The provision does indeed exist for a council to establish a committee-style uh, form of governance. Last week, I attended uh, an environment committee. The local government bill is currently at committee stage, and the committee are diligently and thoroughly going through uh, the legislation clause by clause. I found that out to my expense, just how thoroughly they were going through it. And I, when I appeared before them and they questioned me on many, many clauses within the bill and many issues within the bill, and this was one. There are, it would be certainly my vision that there will be no secret meetings unless there are commercially or personal details of a very sensitive nature. I, I, I believe that all council business, where possible, should be open, and that should extend to the Cabinet 
of any council should a council choose to go down the cabinet system. As it is, I'm not sure how many councils will choose to do so. I, uh, in response to Mr Dixon's question, and we were speaking about selection of councillors in particular roles, I think that on a cabinet, for example, if a council were to go with one, they would want a degree of continuity on that, and I'm not sure that <laughs> what we have proposed in terms of selecting uh, councillors for positions would necessarily allow for that continuity. There have also been questions around the membership of a cabinet and would that automatically include the chair or vice chair or mayor and deputy mayor of, of a council, and if so, would that be an ex officio rule? So there are still quite a lot of Members, uh, two minutes is up, Minister. There's quite a lot of stuff we have to look at there. The committee uh, keep keep at it and I look forward to working with them to, to find as robust a system as possible. Call Mr Alban McGuinness for supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. I know the, man, the Minister is uh, a man dedicated to fairness and proportionality in terms of local government. Uh, could the Minister outline what level of consultation he has had with stakeholders uh, in relation to the system of governance? And in addition to that, what level of consensus was reached in relation to that? Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr McGuinness for the question. The provision of the three alternative methods for ensuring the, the sharing of positions of responsibility was agreed by representatives from the five main political parties on the policy development panel charged with the development of the policy proposals on the governance arrangements for the new councils. This position was subsequently endorsed by the political parties represented on the Strategic Leadership Board. There was significant support for this approach in the responses to the public consultation on the local government reform policy proposals launched on uh, the 30th of November 2010. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, would the Minister acknowledge that while it will ultimately be up to uh, individual local areas to agree largely by consensus as to the way forward of the methodology they use? that in circumstances in which there are a large number of posts to be appointed with a relatively small electorate, i.e. the number of councillors, that single transferable vote is not necessarily the best way of achieving that uh, distribution of responsibilities. I uh, thank uh, Mr Weir for his question. That's why we have given councils or intend to give councils a range of options so councils will be able to choose the system that will work for them. I believe that we should not just be empowering councils but also entrusting councils to make the, the correct decisions. However, should councils not be able to uh, make a decision <laughs> on this, the haunt will be the default position, partially for uh, some of the reasons outlined by Mr Weir. Well, Mr William Irwin for the question. Question number three. My department is working to establish accurately the professional planning and administrative staffing complement required to ensure an effective fit for purpose planning service is transferred to local councils. In preparation for the transfer of planning powers, the department commissioned a workforce planning model to estimate the number of planning staff required in each local council area. It was developed in 2011 in partnership with Fujitsu in response to a recommendation from the Public Accounts Committee that planning needed a mechanism to help determine the resources to transfer under the review of public administration. The workforce model includes administrative staff from admin assist to deputy principal grades and on the professional technical side from PTO to SPTO grades working within development management and enforcement. The staffing requirements for development planning work were excluded as this is not quantified on the number of planning applications received. The workforce model will be rerun 
in April or May when the data for the 2013-14 financial year is available. This will provide more up-to-date figures and will help guide and inform staffing decisions with the statutory transition committees. All staff transferring from the department to local councils will transfer on the basis of tube type arrangements, providing certain protections for staff, including their terms and conditions of employment. Mr. Hayward, for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his reply? Can I ask the Minister, when planning powers pass to local councils, is it possible that, in effect, we could see several different interpretations of planning policy in Northern Ireland? Uh, thank Mr. Ehrman for, for the supplementary question. I think I heard a voice fr from the, the bench saying that we, we might already do. Indeed, uh, planning, is, is, planning policy is open to interpretation, and uh, therefore I think it is inevitable that we will see, and in fact that we do see on occasion, different interpretation of planning policy. However, if that is a genuine concern out there among the public, among ele elected reps, that this transfer of planning powers will actually result in huge inconsistency in the application of planning policy across councils, I must re reassure them that that will not be the case. It is vitally important that the, the planning service is and remains consistent, regardless of who the planning authority is. The Department will retain an oversight role that will be carefully monitoring the performance of each Council, the decisions made by Councils, the decisions not made by Councils, and will be ready, willing and able to step in and assist should Councils be having particular difficulties in their interpretation and application of policy. Harry Michael Duff. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Gorda, Takesht Ira Ugum Donaira. Can I ask the Minister, with specific reference to staff transferring from planning service to the new councils in line with the transfer of powers, what levels of training and familiarisation are being provided or will be provided for those affected staff? Samuel Shin, thank you uh, for, for that interesting and indeed important question. A lot of questions have been asked in various fora, including in, in this chamber, of me in recent times around capacity building around the transfer of planning powers. And all of the focus during the, of those questions, the training has been for elected reps and for councillors who are going to take on planning powers. And I congratulate Mr McEldoff on being the first uh, representative to ask about the training that will be required for planning staff who will be moving to uh, local government as a new um, um, employer. I also assure him that this is, in my consideration, uh, money, the, the money that had been acquired by my predecessor for capacity building applies not solely to elected representatives, and uh, funding has been set aside and programmes set up for the training of our planning officers and staff before their move to local government. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Currently, uh, staff in NIA provide. Uh, expertise and advice on the environmental and beauty heritage issues to planners. What happens post RPA? Can those planners access services from NIEA or you know, will, will councils have to pay for the fees? I thank uh, Ms Lowe for, for that supplementary question. I think an earlier question had maybe suggested that planners currently can't access those services that, that easily. Uh, absolutely, the Environment Agency will remain a statutory consultee on many planning applications. I outlined earlier my intention to review the Environment Agency, how it's structured, how it operates, and I fully anticipate that it will be actually easier for planning officers and applicants and agents to access 
uh, the NIEA throughout the planning application process. And Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, the, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. The Minister did talk about the training that was available for staff, but what, what assurances can he give me about a staff transfer from, from the planning service to local government? And more specifically, can he provide details of the protections that will be afforded to them? I thank uh, Mr. Rogers for his question. It really follows on from that asked by, by Mr. McAldoff. A transfer scheme is currently being developed by DFP for staff transferring to local government with their functions. That's from all departments, but obviously that includes planning staff. This will be negotiated through the normal civil service management and trade union fora and will secure agreement from both sides. Within this transfer scheme, all staff will be afforded protections under TUPE which provides protection for employees against changes to their terms and conditions of employment as a result of a transfer of undertaking. The Department is taking action to minimise the hardship and domestic disruption that may be experienced by individual staff transferred to local councils. A staff preference scheme has been implemented which identifies the locational preferences of all staff in planning and the Department is now working to accommodate as many staff as possible in their preferred location at the date of transfer to local councils. Call Mr Steve Mutry for question. Question number four, Deputy Speaker. The dereliction funding scheme was introduced in March 2012 to provide councils with funding to enhance and improve the cosmetic and aesthetic appearance of an area, whether it is a city, town, village or neighbourhood. Since its introduction, £4 million has been allocated to councils by the programme. In August 2013, I asked all councils to submit proposals in preparation for the October monitoring round. Some 16 councils submitted bids, but as I was unsuccessful in obtaining funding at that time, councils were asked to revise their bids in time for the January monitoring round. At that stage, three councils withdrew their bids. All bids were assessed, and Craig Avonborough Council's bid was placed joint sixth. I was successful in obtaining £500,000 at the January monitoring to which I added £100,000 from my department's funds. This allowed me to fund five of the 13 bids, one in full and four in part. This is a competitive process, and unfortunately, Craig Avonborough Council's bid was just below the cut-off point, as five bids were judged to have more merit on this occasion. The dereliction intervention scheme has been extremely successful and will be a rolling programme which my department will be bidding to maintain. I hope that Craig Avonborough Council will rebid for further funding when resources next become available. Mr. Mutry for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister outline what plans he has to roll out further funding and when to areas like Craig Avon so that they too can enhance their environment and improve their economy and strengthen tourism? I thank uh, Mr Moutry for his supplementary. The dereliction fund, unfortunately, is dependent on how I fare at future monitoring rounds uh, with my executive colleagues. However, given the tremendous success and popularity of the scheme, and given the ever-growing demand for the scheme, I have no doubt that members will be encouraging their colleagues around the executive table to support any future bid of mine for additional funding for this scheme. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And I thank the Minister for his I we knew Darola took the dive August Kavid. Can the minister uh, confirm what areas have been allocated their election funding and how much? Gormay Ogut. Gormay Ogut, for Hanya and Kesh, I was found by much. 
the the successful bidders on this occasion, of which there were five, are as follows. Belfast City Council was awarded £220,000. Ardsborough Council received £111,000. North Down Borough Council £102,000. Newry and Mourne District Council £80,000. Newton Abbey Borough Council £53,000. Oh, there were six. Larne Borough Council, £39,000. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions. And I call Dr Alistair MacDonald. Dr MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, does he agree with the call by our colleagues, Ali Gatwood and, and Councillor Jared Malin, that we should keep lamp posts and streets free from election posters for the three days in May, namely the 9th, the 10th and 11th of May, along the route of the what, Giro d'Italia cycle the race? Minister for the Environment. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the member for the question. I believe that this is a very positive suggestion. The Giro d'Italia has a global audience of 775 million people in 165 countries worldwide with 200 participants and up to an estimated 140,000 spectators. It presents a huge opportunity to showcase the excellent tourism product that Ireland has to offer with key tourist sites including Titanic Belfast, the North Coast and Armagh being especially profiled. I regret that the race isn't coming to Derry, but I think that the hills, the, the, the hills might, might have put them off. One constituent, though, did remark to me that we'd better get used to the gyro not coming if Nelson, <laughs> if Nelson McCausland does to get this way. I believe uh, that there's a, a responsibility on all of us to present the best possible picture of Northern Ireland, and I believe a small step such as this by political parties would reap much greater collective benefits for all people here. I have therefore just today written to all party leaders asking them for their views and cooperation on a voluntary political agreement that will ensure that for the three days of May uh, of the Giro d'Italia when Northern Ireland is on a global stage there will be a poster free route. I look forward to responses from the party leaders and I'm hopeful that a positive political agreement can and will be found. Call Dr. MacDonald for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that lengthy answer and can he be assured of a very positive response from myself uh, and the SDLP to his letter? But can I ask the Minister, has he given any consideration to reviewing the current legislation relating to the display of election posters? including the option of a ban on election posters. Under the legislation as it stands, DOE planning writes to all parties in advance of an election, reminding them of their statutory obligation for displaying election posters, including positioning, road safety issues and subsequent removal within 14 days of the poll closing. Under planning law, no advertisement may be displayed without consent granted by the Department but exemptions exist for election posters in advance of a pending election. The display of election posters is a cause of annoyance for many members of the public, and political parties are reminded of this annoyance every time we have an election. They're also a headache for those of us who have to put them up and take them down, although I've been told that my days of a, a, as a poster boy might be over. It is an issue I am very much aware of. It is something that I am willing to look at. I have been considering a review of current legislation in advance of the media interest in this particular issue. And as part of that review, I will examine a range of options, including a ban. Well, Mr. Colum Eastwood for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the effectiveness of the current legislation around uh, alcohol consumption on public service vehicles? That's uh, certainly 
a topical question indeed. Current law states that it is an offence for a passenger to consume alcohol on a public service vehicle. This is contained in the PSV regulations 1985. The PSNI, PSNI advised that PSV regulations offence is very difficult to enforce as they need to collect evidence that certain individuals consume alcohol on board that vehicle. My officials have therefore put forward options to address this in a consultation last July, including to introduce a restriction on the bus operator's license prohibiting them from carrying alcohol in their vehicles, to create a road traffic offence for operators of carrying alcohol in public service vehicle, or do nothing. Responses to the consultation were mixed, and genuine difficulties were raised with each of the options. Operators highlighted the difficulties their drivers can have in stopping passengers from bringing alcohol on board and consuming it. A number of respondents commented that the only effective solution would be a total ban on the carriage of alcohol on public service vehicles. The creation of such an offence would be a matter for the Department of Justice, and I have recently discussed that with Minister Ford. Other respondents called for a repeal of the current ban on consumption, citing that passengers can consume alcohol on the enterprise, on ferries and on planes. As a result of the responses to the consultation, I proposed a four-pronged approach at this stage. The actions were to commission communication activities to highlight that it is illegal to drink on buses and the road and safety and passenger risks that this poses to introduce a new licensing condition for operators requiring them to highlight to hirers that they cannot consume alcohol, to engage with DOJ around the extension of the current ban on alcohol courage to the whole bus sector in Northern Ireland, and to continue to engage with DHSPPS, who are responsible for the new strategic direction for alcohol and drugs. As problems with alcohol time as well consumption up. on buses form just one facet of the wider societal problems of alcohol in Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the, the Minister for his very comprehensive answer? Um, can I welcome the fact that he's been engaging with the Department of Justice and ask, ask him what kind of response he's received from them? Well, Minister Ford has indicated that he understood the difficulties with enforcing the current offence and the risks to public and passenger safety that could result. He indicated that his department had an extensive legislative programme already underway and would consider this issue alongside that. I would just emphasise that the consultation highlighted what I think many of us already know, that there is no one solution to this problem. Indeed, the problem is not one of drinking on buses per se. Rather, this is one element of general issues with alcohol in society, and there is little purpose in looking at the issue of alcohol or drinking in buses without considering other elements such as the price of alcohol in shops, the promotions on alcohol purchased in venues, and the health risks associated with alcohol. I think all of us within this chamber and any parents among us as well have a responsibility to work together to address these issues. Well, Mr. Alex Maskey for a question. Mr. Well, I was actually going to ask the Minister earlier, would he assure Willie Fraser that Chiro Italia's colours are actually an Italian tricolour? But uh, if I could ask the Minister, um, Alison Curley, that uh, given the recent very unfortunate events and indeed dangerous events at the weekend at the Odyssey, uh, the Minister has already been dealing with the whole question of, of, of buses and alcohol available on buses, and I don't want to prejudge any investigation into what happened at the weekend? Has the Minister got any update for the House this afternoon in respect of the allegations around buses being used to ferry alcohol and at the weekend towards the Odyssey? I uh, thank Mr Maskey for that question. Uh, um, I have just answered uh, Mr Eastwood's question and, and, and see this very much as a follow on to that. Yes, I am aware of alcohol consumption on many buses and coaches uh, responsible for taking young people to an event in the Odyssey on Thursday night. And that is something that I have said we have to address. We have to deal as a department or engage with the proprietors and operators of those buses and ensure that they were 
taking every step possible to ensure that alcohol wasn't being consumed in their bus, particularly by minors, which is again another criminal offence. I've outlined the difficulty in actually enforcing this, and uh, I mean the, the, the PSNI seem. I don't know if reluctant is the right word, but certainly incapable of doing so. Apparently, if they stop a vehicle and go on, they have to have evidence of an individual consuming drink on that bus. And what generally happens is someone drops a can or bottle and denies all knowledge of it. And without, without evidence, th 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 there can't be further action on it. I know it's something that causes headaches and heartache for responsible bus operators who find themselves in the position of, of having to almost frisk passengers getting on. I spoke there of the potential, and had had this conversation with the Minister of, of Justice, of an outright ban of the carriage of alcohol on buses, but that seems a bit draconian, in that, and that, that would actually result in someone not being able to get a meal deal in Marks and Spencers with a bottle of wine and get the, the bus home. So, I mean, there is a lot of work to be done on this issue, but I do think it is a wider societal issue than Mr. just Mr. time is up again. Call Mr. Maskey for supplementary. Gormagalaskin, I thank the Minister for that response. I do appreciate that it is a complex issue, and it is for one for a wider society, but nevertheless, there is legislation in place. And could I ask the Minister, could he assure the House that he will consider? With the PSNI, with particularly the DOJ, uh, looking at what other measures may be taken, and of course making sure that it is not disproportionate to the extent of the problem, but even if that necessitates uh, amending current legislation. I uh, would certainly be happy to give the member and indeed this House uh, the assurance that, that I remain committed to focusing on this issue. I know it's something that my predecessor was uh, particularly uh, fixed about, and uh, it's something that, that, that I would like to address as well. And Thursday's unfortunate incident brought it all to the fore. However, I, I would re-emphasise the events of Thursday are, in, in many ways, a microcosm of what goes on in every town, in every village, in every city across the north every weekend with young people drinking to excess, and I, I think it is incumbent upon not just my department, not just DOJ, not just us as elected representatives, but on parents to assume responsibility, and indeed young people as well. Mr. William Humphrey for questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister and thank him for his answers so far? Following the publication of the Bills Report in December of last year, what steps has his department taken to reduce waste crime and illegal dumping in Northern Ireland? Okay, I thank the, the, the member for his question. I, the, the Mills report was commissioned by my predecessor following the discovery of waste crime of a, on a scale previously unseen, in fact, previously, I dare say, undreamt of here in Northern Ireland, in fact, in my own constituency. And it has elicited a prompt and, I believe, robust response from my department. A number of actions have been taken even before we received the Mills report. My predecessor secured £1.5 million in the June 2013 monitoring round, and this has been used to employ 10 extra waste enforcement experts in NIEA's Environmental Crime Unit, clean up some of the waste at the Camp C illegal waste dump that posed the most immediate environmental risk, buy specialist investigation equipment. This funding has helped the NIEA set up a major waste crackdown through what is known as Operation Toothfish. This operation is being led by the NIEA's Environmental Crime Unit with the assistance of the PSNI. And the operation currently involves 25 investigations covering 31 sites and 42 suspected companies and individuals across Northern Ireland, which is a a worrying scale indeed. But this is a comprehensive crackdown which is targeting a variety of potential types of waste crime, illegal landfill, refuse derived fuel, fuel laundering, end of life vehicles and waste tyres. The operation is the start 
of a programme of action over the next few years to reduce the creation of waste and establish a fully compliant waste industry here in Northern Ireland. Mr Humphrey, for a very quick supplementary. Thank, thank you, Minister, for his answer. Uh, can I ask the Minister to provide assurances that his department will be liaising with the Department of Justice to ensure that the serious issue of waste crime in Northern Ireland that he has acknowledged will be addressed by uh, increased sentencing as applies across the United Kingdom? A very quick answer from the Minister yeah, as well. Uh, this is an issue that I have also raised in, in a, another recent meeting with the DOJ and officials of mine and DOJ recently held a joint seminar on the, the very issue of waste crime. I think it is important that the severity of sentence should reflect the seriousness of a crime. And as it stands, the, the sentences that we have, the punishment, is not sufficient deterrent, given the vast profits that are, are there to be made for uh, opportunists and criminals. That concludes question time.